Good morning, everyone. Uh, it'd be good if you had your Bibles open at Mark's Gospel. Uh, we're particularly looking at uh, chapter 4, verse 35, and then through chapter 5 as well this morning. Uh, only part of it was read earlier, but we're going to look at really four incidents that happen over these verses. One at the end of chapter 4, and then three more in chapter 5. We're going to begin by asking you, uh, I wonder what scares you in life? What scares you? What frightens you? Or worries you? A lot. Here's some suggestions of things that might do. What about being trapped on a sinking ship in a violent storm? I should think that's truly frightening. Or what about being confronted by a deranged man who hangs around in graveyards and can snap iron chains with his bare hands? Would you be a bit frightened if you met someone like that? I think I would. Or one that uh, maybe you've seen people go through. An ongoing terminal illness. Slowly but surely eating away at that person, racking them with pain. If that was you, would you be frightened? Or perhaps most horrifying of all, imagine a child a young child, your child, suddenly taken ill with no warning, rapidly slipping away, no one there to save her as you wait for help, wait for the ambulance perhaps to arrive. Well, all of these situations are are real life situations that develop and take place in Mark's Gospel, chapters four and five. And The common theme that that runs through them, really, or one of the common themes that runs through them, is fear. Fear. There's another theme, thankfully, that runs through as well, and that is faith. Fear and faith are side by side in Mark chapters 4 and 5. Let's think about the first of those things, though. Uh, as we begin. Let's think about fear. When life is frightening. I began by asking what scares you in life and and then gave some scary situations that take place in in Mark 4 and 5. Uh, But but what actually scares you? Perhaps you found the last few months quite scary uh, in terms of the, the pandemic that we're facing. It has been frightening at times, hasn't it? Especially early on, it was frightening. And even now, you you may still feel a lot of fear about heading out and meeting people. It's frightening. Uh, Maybe other things might frighten you. Uh, I saw a a trailer for a film, and I still remember it. It was a couple of years ago now. Uh, But it was for a film called Sully. Uh, about a, a plane, a, a pilot of a plane who had to land his plane, emergency landing on the Hudson River. And I still remember in the trailer, there's the point at which the, the pilot says to everyone on board, brace, brace. Oh, I'd hate to hear those words on a plane because <laughs> it means you're, you're heading for a crash landing. It's stuff of nightmares. Well, the first incident in our passage this morning is at the end of uh, Mark and chapter 4 and verses 35 uh, to 41. And you have the disciples here who are terrified by what is happening to them. Uh, They're in a boat uh, with Jesus and on that boat, as they sail across the lake, a great windstorm arises in verse 37. The waves were huge, they were breaking over and into the boat, threatening to overwhelm it. The boat was filling up with water. They were terrified. In fact, they thought they were going to die. Remember that a number of them were were hardened fishermen. They're used to being at sea in a boat. And yet they think here that they're going to perish. End of verse 38. They're perishing as far as they're concerned. They're dying. All hope is lost, they seem to feel. Terrified. Or look at chapter 5. Chapter 5 
uh, and verses 1 to 20, uh, you have the tale of a man described as, as demon-possessed. Uh, it's possessed by a demon that is described as legion, verse 9. In other words, it wasn't just a demon that had possessed this man. It was an army of them. He lived amongst the tombs. Uh, people had tried to bind him with chains, presumably because he was dangerous, violent, so they tried to chain him up. But such was his terrifying strength that he could just take those metal chains and snap them, break them off himself, so that he could roam around again. Uh, this man is in a terrible state, but he's also in a terrifying state for anybody who comes across him. No one went anywhere near him, and with good reason. Maybe you've come across some people in life that you would give a very wide berth to. You don't know what they might do. I'll be honest, there were one or two people I met in my previous job in a job centre who it wasn't so bad meeting them in the job centre because there was a security guard. But I wouldn't have wanted them hanging around for me outside afterwards if I'd crossed them. Pretty frightening, some of them. But sometimes it, it isn't things outside of us that are frightening, like the weather here or other people. Sometimes it's something about ourselves. In 525, chapter 5, verse 25, we read about a woman who'd had a discharge of blood for 12 years. That's a long time, isn't it? Uh, we're not told uh, what was causing that discharge. Uh, no doctor it would seem had figured it out. But 12 years of trying to get it sorted... And doctors had, had not succeeded. It seemed to only make the woman worse, not better. <coughs> she's now in poverty because she spent all her money on medical fees. And illness can be, can be frightening, can't it? Really frightening. Especially when it's severe. Even more so, perhaps, if it's terminal. When it just won't go away as days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months, and then months begin to turn into years. Oh, there's a fear. Will I ever be free of this? Then you have another case of illness in Mark 5, from verse 21 to the end of the chapter. I dare say if I had a choice between being ill myself or one of my children being desperately ill, I'd choose myself. Because it's terrifying to think that your child might become terminally ill. Well, in verse 22 of chapter 5, a man called Jairus comes to Jesus. He falls at Jesus' feet. He begins to implore him earnestly, we're told. This man's body language, the desperation in his voice, I'm sure it would have instantly told anyone there as he fell at Jesus' feet that something was terribly, terribly wrong. And it is. His daughter, who is just 12 years old, is at the point of death. Can you imagine the fear? Maybe you know something of that kind of fear in this situation. It would get worse for this man, though, before it would get better. His worst fear, his worst nightmare is actually realised in verse 35 as he's given the news, your daughter is dead. Fear then stalks Mark chapter 4 and chapter 5. Again, what has the potential to fill your life with fear? We all have our fears, don't we? There can be fears about financial security. Perhaps your job is on the line. You're not sure if it'll last and what will you do for money? Perhaps you do have fears about your health about how you might become ill or, how, or about how you are currently ill. And it does fill you with fear. Perhaps fears about your children or elderly parents or a spouse or a close friend. Perhaps fears about the future. And perhaps you fear still the situation we're in and think, will things ever return to normal? Will I ever be free of the, the fear of things continuing like this? Perhaps there are fears from your past that haunt you, fears about your mental health, fears about the world that we're living in at the moment. Not just the pandemic, but perhaps political instability as well. Makes you fearful. 
fears about just facing work tomorrow, facing that person tomorrow, fears about just coping with life in general. Is there an answer to it? Well, thankfully, these fears do not need to loom large in the Christian's life, in your life, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark 4 and 5, you see, tell us of something, or rather someone, who is more fear-worthy than anything else you can imagine. And that is actually good news. Uh, I remember as I first looked at this passage, a line from an old hymn kept coming back to my mind. It was, fear him, you saints, and you will then have nothing else to fear. Fear Jesus. And it will put all of the fears in perspective. There's a huge amount of truth contained in that, that simple line, fear him, you saints, and you will then have nothing else to fear. Just stop and think about it for just a moment. If a, a churning, swirling, violent, life-threatening storm is scary, how much more scary is a man who could get up from his bed in the boat and say to such a storm, be still. And instantly, it is. I think it would be scary to be in the presence of someone who can do that. Or if a supernaturally strong, chain-snapping, demon-possessed, graveyard-haunting man is terrifying. How much more terrifying is a man in front of whom that demon-possessed man cowers and begs? A leniency. Or if 12 years of physical and mentally debilitating illness and now poverty too is frightening. How much more frightening a man whose clothing you just have to touch and that illness vanishes in a moment. Or if your 12 year old daughter dying is petrifying. <laughs> How much more a man who raises the dead as easily as he wakes someone up from sleep. Sometimes an over-familiarity with the gospel accounts of what Jesus did, and this is something I can be guilty of at times too, an over-familiarity with these stories leads to a, a failure to understand it, a forgetting of just how fearsome Jesus' power actually is. It's terrifyingly powerful. I mean, just look at the reaction of the people who actually were there to witness what Jesus did in this passage. You, first of all, you have the disciples in the boat with him. Now, remember, they'd spent a lot of time with Jesus. But they're in the boat with him during the storm, scared out of their wits, convinced that they're dying. Jesus calms the whirlwind with just a word, verse 39. Peace be still. What's their response? Well, if anything, they become even more afraid than they were while the storm was raging. But they're not afraid of the weather anymore, obviously. They're afraid of Jesus. Verse 41. They were filled with great fear. And said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Just imagine you were to go outside right now and there was somebody standing in your garden or your backyard talking to the weather, saying snow and it happened. How would you feel about that person? I think you'd be pretty scared. <laughs> Sometimes you see those street ma magicians, don't you? And uh, they get somebody close to them and, and by sleight of hand, suddenly make a, a card appear in a jar or whatever it is. And you look at the, the shock and slight terror on the face of the person as they see it happen. Well, it's far more than that that's gonna happen if you see someone just command the weather to change and it does. I'd be terrified. 
What about the demon-possessed man and the demons who possessed him? Well, they're terrified of Jesus. They know who he is. Look at verses 6 and 7 of chapter 5. And when he, that's the demon-possessed man, saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. You see, here, Jesus is seen immediately to be somewhat far more powerful than a legion of demons. And a legion of demons are a a horrifyingly powerful thing. But in front of Jesus, they're reduced to a quivering wreck. The people, uh, Gerasenes, they're called in verse 1. These were were non-Jewish people who lived on the other side of the lake. They lived near this demon-possessed man, though. They find out that he's healed the man. What is the Gerasenes' reaction? Well, actually, it's fear, isn't it? Verse 16, and those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Maybe that's not surprising when you stop and think about it. You've had this man, this demon-possessed man, striking terror into your life for who knows how long, That a man that can't be bound with chains even though they've tried. And then just some stranger turns up from the Jewish side of the lake. And with complete ease, totally overpowers the demons who had possessed him. It's not even a contest, just an instant submission by legion. It's understandable that in verse 17, they beg Jesus to depart. He had terrifying power. So far with the disciples on the lake, the Gerasenes by the lake, we've seen a fear of Jesus that seems to be just sheer terror. (laughs) Sheer terror. The disciples and then the Gerasenes see an awesomely powerful man and they're petrified. There's a crucial change though with the next two cases of fearing Jesus. Because with the ill woman and Jairus, the dead girl's father, fear now is mingled with faith. So it's a different sort of fear. They fear Jesus, but they also put their faith in Jesus. And therefore they have nothing else to fear. You see it with the woman. She had faith in Jesus, the all-powerful Jesus, that he could do for her what no doctor in 12 years of trying had succeeded in doing. Uh, Look at verses 27 and 28. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. So there's faith. But there's also an appropriate fear as well. And when it's discovered that she's the one who has touched Jesus' clothing, so that power went out from him to heal her, She did what, verse 33? She came in fear and trembling before him and told the whole truth. She's not condemned for that. She's commended for it in verse 34. She's commended for her faith by Jesus. Her faith in him through which she now has healing and peace, had his peace with God. Fear and faith in Jesus mingled together. It's the same for Jairus. Uh, When the news comes through that his daughter has died, uh, verse 35, before Jesus has managed to get to the house where she was, Jesus' instant response is to say to him in verse 36, Do not fear, only believe. Do not fear your daughter's death. Have faith that I am more powerful than death. Fear my power more than you fear death's power and then trust me to use my fearsome power to overpower death. Now Jesus' faith in that overpowering might, sorry Jairus' faith in that overpowering might of Jesus proved to be well placed, didn't it? 
as Jesus raised his daughter from the dead in verse 41. Let's take some application for ourselves from, from all of this. How are we to apply it? Well, earlier on, we asked the question, what scares us in life? What fears are, fills us with fear? Well, whatever it is, Jesus provides us with a way to overcome those fears. And by replacing fear for those things, fear of those things, with fear of someone far greater. If we will see Jesus for who he really is, the all-powerful Son of God, then we can swap the fears of this life for the fear of someone far more powerful than any other fear. But of course, Jesus invites us not only to fear him. If that's all that the swap involved, then we'd be going from being terrified of one thing to terrified of another. No, he also invites us to put our faith in him. Yes, this passage reminds us that Jesus has a power and a might that really should make us fear him. But it also reminds us that he lovingly invites us to trust him. To trust that he will use his almighty power to bless us not destroy us. The greatest fear we ought to have if we don't yet fear and trust Jesus is a fear of how one day God will deal with us because of our sin. All the things that might scare you now are as nothing compared to standing before God's judgment seat one day when Christ returns. The Bible says that there is nothing worse than to fall into the hands of a holy God a just and righteous and wrathful God. That is truly terrifying. But in love, of course, the Father sent the Son to face and overcome that fear for us too. Jesus himself, God the Son, faced his Father's terrifying anger and judgment upon our sin at the cross. He faced it, he felt it to the full, and because of it, he died. But he then rose again, having paid in full for our sin. He conquered sin, rising to life again, showing that we are justified when we put our faith in him. You see, God in the gospel has overpowered the most frightening thing of all, sin and all its results. Sin and its inevitable result for us personally of, of paying the price for our sin one day in hell if we don't trust Jesus. But also sin and all the other fearful things it produces. Uncontrollable weather storms. Demon possession. <laughs> illness. Death. One day, all those fears will be fully conquered too because... Jesus paid the price for sin on the cross. One day, all those things that we fear now will be no more. And for the Christian, we will inherit a, a new heavens and a new earth where there is no more pain, no more suffering, no more fear of anyone or anything apart from God himself, but it will be a trusting fear of him who loves us. So have you exchanged a debilitating fear of, yes, this world's problems, but also judgment from God on your sin for a faith-filled fear of Jesus who loves you? It's a fantastic exchange. Because when you fear Jesus, whilst knowing that he loves you enough to have faced death for you, and has brought you onto his side, then you truly have nothing else to fear. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you and acknowledge that you are to be feared above anything and anyone else. You are God, God the Son, 
and you have power beyond all that we can imagine. So we pray that we would recognise you for who you truly are. And we pray that as well we would recognise that whatever fears we face in this life, we ought rightly to face something far more fearsome, which is your, your wrath for our sin. Help us to see that and then help us to, to turn from our sin and put our faith in you if we haven't already. To pay the price for our sin on the cross. And Lord, for those of us who have put our faith in you, we pray that our eyes would remain fixed on you, that we would fear you above all else and then have nothing else to fear. Knowing that we are yours, knowing that whatever may scare us in this life will not last and will not win. You have conquered all at the cross. And our future, our hope is secure. We thank you for that. Lord, help us to fear nothing but you. And we ask it in your name. Amen.